Good morning, everybody. It's over. It's over. We're free. We're out of thermodynamics. It just, it, it, Brian, would you call it the speed run? Yeah. Two weeks and it's 30. Right? A whole lot better than what they used to do at uh, Bobo's community. They used to do six weeks of thermodynamics or something like that. Eight weeks of thermodynamics. All right. So, this is a bit of a reboot. Right? Okay. This is this is uh, this is physics four C phase three, right? Okay, the end game is coming. But um, we can we can safely, and I know next Tuesday you'll get your exams back and all that kind of stuff. And I, I heard the talk out there about astronauts and whatever. <laughs> I know there's a lot of things. But um, we can we can say you can say to forget where we are. Like you seriously, you could it never happened. I'm really, I'm not going to refer to it anymore. However, we do need to bridge a gap today. We need to bridge a gap between the first unit of this course, which was simple harmonic motion and wave, and what we're going to do for the rest of the semester. Fair warning, okay? My master's degree is in optics. Um. Okay, so this is like my favorite subject of all time, and it starts with a history lesson. I, so much of history is going on behind the scenes, like in physics 4A. The stories we can tell you about where the stuff came from and Galileo, Kepler, and Newton, and I just, it's, oh, it's amazing. It really is amazing. And it is one of the greatest stories of human innovation and intelligence and, and just ability and all that kind of stuff. And we never get a chance to tell you about it because in 4A we have too much stuff to talk about. And then in 4B, it's the same story, although in 4B I couldn't stop talking about Michael Faraday though. I finally can tell you a story. And and this, I'm not just telling you the story because it's fun, right? That kind of stuff. This is the story that is going to frame the rest of the semester. Like, it's hard to teach the rest of the semester if you don't know what's going on in history and why what we're going to move into is going to fuel a revolution in thought and how we understand. And so what I want to do is, is in the next 20 minutes, try to give you a very short history lesson that is going to give context for everything that's going to go. In this lesson, this lecture, you will never be required to tell me a date. But I do consider it fair game for you to kind of know who did what. But I did ask you about that. I want to do on an exam, right? And I would consider that kind of question like low-hanging fruit, right? That would be the easy question I gave you. It was an easy question on the exam yesterday. Yeah. And it caused quite a few people, it was on both exams, okay? Something similar, okay? And people were coming up to me and going, Mr. Baylo, can it be this? I was like, I can't answer that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Those of you that are wondering, there was an answer that was zero on the exam. Wait. Wait. <laughs> and in case, I mean, you know, you should know this by now. You should know. There's like an easy question. And then there's usually like a really hard question, and then there's ten other questions that are somewhere in between. Right? Okay? So it just naturally tends to work out that way. Or I tend to see like a hard question. I'm like, ah, oh, it's a good one to ask. And then I try to balance it with the. Unfortunately, the easy ones tend to screw you up more than the hard ones do. It's too easy. It's too easy. All right. So let's start. And we're going to ask the question today. We're going to get there. But let's ask a run up 
question to it. How do you make light? <laughs> this is how you make light, right? Okay, <laughs> right? You push a button, right? And the lights go on and they go off, right? Okay, but let's fundamentally get down to it. Like, what does light come? How do you make it? <laughs> how do you make it? <laughs> Burn something. Right? Whether it's the nuclear furnace of the sun, or a light bulb, or fire, essentially you gotta heat something up, don't you? You gotta heat something up until it begins to glow, right? So, we've known how to make light for a long time, okay? And, and our ways of bottling up and getting it to be on demand have changed very rapidly in the last 100 years. But, but, the, but our species has known how to, how to chase back the darkness for quite a while, okay? So that's a preliminary question. Another preliminary question is this one. And I think you know the answer. 2.998 times 2 .998, so 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. How fast is that? Our brains really can't, can't do it. It's, I never remember exactly what the number is, but like light can go around the circumference of the equator of our planet like 15 or 17 times in one second, right? Okay, so it's, it's, it's fast, right? And we didn't always know that it was fast, and I and I wish, oh God, I wish I had time to tell you more stories about this because it's just it's so good. But let's not get distracted, okay, about how we know how fast light goes. Maybe if I have time later, I can tell you more of the story. Let's get to the key question. Key question. And it pains me. It pains me. I want to tell you a lot of this stuff. But let's try to answer this one. What is it? A wave. A wave? A particle? A wave and a particle? What if I told you we still don't know? What if I told you that this question has fueled the entirety of scientific discovery going back as far as you want to say this is when science starts? Because this question has really been, it's like, it's like number two in the great human question. The first one being, what's on the other side of the mountain? Like, before you even get to like religion and why am I here and what's the meaning of life, humans have been like, oh, what's over there, right? Bears, dragons, who knows? Let's go find out. You can't keep us from doing that. And the harder you try, the more we push back at it, and now we're gonna go to Mars, right? Like, that's gonna happen in our lifetime. Like, <laughs> humans, we're amazing. We're, we're despicable, but we're amazing, right? So second only that question of what's on the other side of the mountain, what's on the other side of the horizon, is this question, what is light? And it's, 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 a, it's a philosophical question, it's a religious question, it's a political question, but it's a very much a scientific question. One that has fueled scientists Natural philosophers that then morphed into scientists and kept going, really just kind of every, every who's who, and even the ones we have lost to the ravages of history and, and we don't know about because they didn't write things down or they won't, weren't rich enough, male enough, or white enough for the record to stay behind, have been asking this question. And we're going to tackle just a few of them, and unfortunately they're all rich white males. Starting with this guy. Of course, you knew we had, he has to weigh in, right? He's the guy that invents physics. So, what did Newton think light was? You got, you got to understand. He writes the Principia, right? Which is this Latin text on the laws of the universe, right? His three laws of motion, laws of gravity. But he also wrote another one called Optica, which was bigger and longer. <laughs> and was all about 
light and optics and how glasses and telescopes and everything else worked. Newton's idea, okay? Here it is, by the way, okay? Newton's optics was this um, Bible of the physics that we knew at the time about how light interacts with matter. And for Newton, there was, there was one answer, really. There, there, there wasn't any other, okay? And I'm, I'm glossing over a ton of stuff here. But Newton insisted that light was a particle. It had particle-like properties. It, it reflected off of things, right? Just like a tennis ball, right? And they had tennis in Newton's day, okay? It's like a tennis ball would bounce off of something. Light does the same. It does a lot of mirrors and all these other things, right? And of course Newton knew about waves. But there's a big problem with waves and light. How does the light from the sun get to the earth if it travels to the emptiness of space? What's one thing that a wave needs? That a particle doesn't. It's a medium in which to travel, right? And in Newton's time, space was empty. It was the void between, right? And nowadays we know space isn't very empty, but there really isn't enough media. Sound can't travel out there, right? Mechanical vibrations don't travel through space. So there couldn't possibly be any component of light that was a wave. And Newton's I'm, I'm, again, I'm grossly overstating his summary here, but basically he said, look, the sun is a problem. And so the sun gives off particles of light, he called them corpuscles of light, that travel through the empty space, interact with the atmosphere, get to the earth, plants soak it up, blah, 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 blah. So think about that. Newton, how much... Social media presence does Newton have? Almost zero. Hundred percent. Like, like back in the day, if Newton said something, what did the rest of the scientific community do? Yes. Uh, right. Man. Newton says it must be. I mean, this is the guy that invented physics, right? This is the guy that sh that proved like the the planet, the this that, right? Gravity. Oh my gosh! And if Newton says light must be a particle, then by golly, light is a particle. Don't, don't, no, 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 can't say anything. Can't say anything, right? Newton is regarded, right, like right up there, okay, with like Moses coming down out of the mountain going, you know, there's 10 things we really need to talk about, right? It's just. <laughs> If he says it, it is. Without question. Because he's a genius. He knows what he's doing. So Newton publishes optics, right, in the um, early mid 1700s. I think maybe middle 1700s. Don't remember exactly what the date is. I should never be a history teacher. And in 18. Three, a British physicist by the name of Thomas Young, who ironically was young at the time. He was like 24 or something like that. Okay? So he's finished with his schooling, established in his career, is doing some experiments. And like every scientist, he's, he's messing with light. It's, just, it's something that crops up all the time. You see it in their writings. They can't, they can't let go of what is light. And what Thomas Young is doing is kind of novel. Okay? It, it really hasn't been done before. He's playing around with something called a double slit. And we're going to get there. We're going we're gonna to do, do all of this in, in much more detail than you probably ever wanted to see. But what he's doing is he's taking a light source. Now, he didn't have a light bulb. He didn't have a laser. Okay? But he happens the sun. But he could sort of collimate that beam or get it to all kind of go in one narrow direction. They're starting on a slit by being very clever. 
but he's got like two slits, a light source, two slits, and the light passes through these two slits. They're very closely spaced. They're, it's very small, kind of hard. If, if I showed you a double slit for light nowadays, you'd go, there's nothing there. It's there, okay? It's very hard to see, but two very narrow slits, very close together. We're calling like tenths of a millimeter apart from each other, right? And he's in, and he's seeing these patterns that are emerging as he shines light through this double slit. He's seeing this zebra pattern on the wall. And from these experiments, Thomas Young realizes something fundamental about the nature of light. Because if you threw a bunch of tennis balls, okay, towards a couple of windows that are spaced a little bit far apart from each other, what pattern would you expect to see on the, uh, say the windows are open, okay, and you dip each pen tennis ball in paint first, okay? So that as you throw it, you can see where the tennis ball lands. You'd expect a lot of tennis balls to just hit the wall that the windows are on, right? Not go through the windows. What pattern would you see on the wall behind the windows? Be like window shaped, wouldn't it? Right? Like if we did the sort of a top down view where the windows here and here and here's the wall, we'd expect a lot of marks on the wall like right behind where the windows are, right? Maybe one of them came in, bounced off the edge, and made it to here. There might be a few, right, that are behind the shadow of the wall where the windows are, right? But a majority of them are going to be concentrated behind the openings of the window. This is not what Thomas Young has seen. Thomas Young, for the first time, is seeing a pattern where instead of <laughs> the maximum number of hits. So basically he's doing the same thing with light. He's sending light towards a double slit. What he's seeing is a really, really bright spot or a bright part of the pattern directly behind where there shouldn't be any light at all. And then there's a dark spot, then there's a bright spot, then there's a dark spot, then there's a light spot. Bright and dark, bright and dark one after the other. You've heard this before. I did the experiment in class where I had the speakers going and you shifted your head back and forth. And what did you experience as you shifted your head back and forth? It wasn't Doppler. It got loud and then it got quieter. And just moving your head, like you, get, you could find the spot where it was really loud, but you could also find the spot where it was not so loud. What was that demonstration of? Wave interference. Constructive and destructive overlapping of waves. What does Thomas Young realize this back and forth pattern is of bright and dark? It's an interference pattern. It's the waves of light, top picture, as they pass through those slits, spreading out, overlapping on top of each other. And when they strike the screen, there's spots where they're overlapping, where both of the waves are peaking. And then right next to it, another space where both of the waves are troughing. And then there's spots where the waves One's peaking, one's troughing, and wiping the intensity of the wave out. Bright and dark, bright and dark, bright and dark. What has Thomas Young discovered? Light as a wave. Because particles don't do this. Particles do not make interference patterns. When particles interfere with each other, we call that pass interference. Right? Like you can't have a particle be at the same place at the same time as another particle. But waves can. And so in showing that light interferes, Thomas Young has shown that light is a wave. Newton is dead. <laughs> but the scientific community still believes that Newton was right, that light is a particle. So, so, so what do you do? You're a young scientist, you want to make your mark on the world, what do you do? 
Well, he's got it's already experiment done. Yes, Oh, okay. So this is science, right? So we don't just go to Twitter, right? We we'll start blabbing stuff out, right? So actually, he does kind of do something like that. He goes to a conference. It's, it was Twitter back in the day, right? Okay, and um, he goes to the national conference of all physicists everywhere, which is the it's the international scientific community is centered in Paris, France, in this day and age. And so he goes to Paris for the annual meeting of all the physicists in the world, the people that could make it there. And, uh, and by world, of course, we mean Europe. And he gets together, and he signs up to deliver a lecture, a paper, right, at the conference. So try to, try to imagine. This is, this is like, this is Europe in the 1800s, proper. Right, and all that kind of stuff, right? And so generally these conferences go something like person is lecturing, audience is sitting there listening, and then there's a point at the end where you can ask questions. But the one thing you never do, ever, ever do, when the person at the front is speaking is what? Never interrupt them, right? Thomas Young stands up, begins delivering his paper on the interference of light, double slit experiment. When a scientist, older gentleman, 50s, okay, clears his throat, <clears throat> stands up and says, excuse me, good sir, in a heavy French accent, <laughs> and says, I think you're wrong. It was Newton. <laughs> well, it wasn't Newton. This guy's name was Poisson which is French for fish, which has nothing to do with the story. I just think it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> this scientist with that name of Poisson gets up, inter stops Thomas Young in the middle of the thing saying, basically, you are directly contradicting Newton. You have to stop. And Thomas Young's like, no. This is the experiment. This is the evidence that I have. Okay, I'm presenting. A bit of a back and forth takes place. This is like the high age of like Victorian ideals and values. And when your honor is being questioned, what do you do? If you are a stupid white male of aristocratic descent. You duel, don't, right? Okay, pistols or swords, pick one. But we're going to go out in the street and kill each other, because that'll prove who's right. <laughs> but we're still doing it. <laughs> it's just called politics. We'll get over it someday. <laughs> but these are scientists. They know better. So it's not a duel that takes place. It's a what? It's an experiment. This is science, right? And Poisson is going, well, I don't believe yourself. I think you've done something wrong. And so Maxwell's like, well, okay, so what do you propose? And on the fly, Poisson's like, okay, well, if you're right, Mr. Thomas Young, then you're saying light bends through the opening. So therefore, light would bend around. This is a known thing at the time. Now that we call this diffraction, the, the bending of light as it rounds an object. Okay, so what Poisson says is, look, let's take a beam of light, okay, and this is all going to be very small, but I'm trying to get there. Take a beam of light, and let's put a small round object in the beam, like a metal BB ball bearing, something like that. According to you, Thomas Young, the light will bend around the spherical object and should intersect somewhere on the other side. In the shadow cast by the object, there should be a bright spot right in the middle of the shadow. I, Poisson, believe that that spot is not there. Thomas Young says, you're on. They stop the conference. Like, like the conference is over. This is like, what's going on here, right? And let me. 
give you a quote from Thomas Young. He wrote this in 1801. Okay? What's he saying? Blasphemy! What does the word venerate mean? Honor, admire, respect, okay? As much as I respect Newton, I'm not obligated to believe that he's always right, okay? Infallible, right? I'm not gonna believe that he's a god, that he's perfect. He can make mistakes. He was liable to err, make mistakes, and that the authority he has, Newton's word, this outsized role he has in scientific thinking could possibly have what? Retarded. That word used to mean slowed down. Okay? Has slowed down. This guy is a rebel. Can you believe the things that he is saying? And so two camps form. There is a camp that is led by Augustine Fresnel, who jumps to Thomas Young's defense and says, no, this guy has good ideas. He's done good experiments. We have to listen to him. And then there's a camp that is championed by Poisson. And Poisson is defending, Simeon Poisson, is defending the, the old guard, that light is a particle. Very literally, this schism develops between the people that thought that light was a wave, from Thomas Young's experiment, to people that thought that light was a particle. And so a contest was set up. Okay, with prize money, right? For anybody that could definitively prove. Poisson has already put forth his idea, right? This idea of diffraction leaving a dot in the shadow of whatever the light is, is being on, right? And Fresnel is defending Thomas Young's experiment. So, so basically we've got experiment versus experiment, right? Grudge match of the century. Wave versus particle. I mean, Poisson looks like he's had few, too many Twinkies. Right? But maybe that's just because the artist wasn't being terribly favorable. I mean, he is balding. Anyway. Let's do the experiment, shall we? I know you can't really hear the volume, but that's okay. You don't really need to hear the volume. What you need to see is what happens when you shine light on a tiny, tiny ball. It's not very bright, but it is there. To this day, what is that spot called? Plus on spot. <laughs> <laughs> Named after the person that believed it would not be there. Not because scientists are vindictive and they wanted to poke fun at Poisson for the rest of his life, although I'm sure that happened. <clears throat> but because Poisson was the first person to put forth a correct explanation, a mechanism for what would become observed fact in the experimental process. Things are often named after the discoverer, even though in this case, Poisson did not want to discover this. <laughs> Scientists can be very mean. Ernest Rutherford, who we'll hear about later, once said that physics is the only true science, everything else is stamp collecting. 
he was talking about chemistry. <laughs> Ernest Rutherford hated chemistry. Ernest Rutherford won the Nobel Prize for his work on the models of the atom. So that I have you're going to do something great with thermodynamics. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Name something in thermodynamics after me, I think I will just, I'll leave. I'll leave the planet. I'll just, just. What is the conclusion? There's no, there's no way around it. You cannot do Poisson Spa by doing particle physics. Particles simply don't do that. Okay? Only waves can interfere. Only waves can diffract. There are four wave phenomena. I mentioned them when we studied waves, and I'm going to be talking a lot about them again. There's reflection, the bouncing. Refraction, the changing of a wave direction when, when it changes medium. Particles can do both of those things. If you throw a rock into a river, it will change the direction of travel when it enters the water, because it slows down. But the other two phenomena, interference and diffraction, those cannot be replicated by particles. Only waves can interfere, be it the same place at the same time. Only waves can bend around an obstruction. Particles will simply bounce off. So light has to be a wave. Newton must be wrong. But there is like an 80-20 split that eventually happens. 80% of the scientific community is with Newton. Light's a particle. There's something else going on here we don't understand because Thomas Young and Fresnel and all you crazy rebels, how do you explain sunlight? How do you explain sunlight? If light's a wave, there has to be a medium in which it is traveling through. So what is the medium of light? Space is empty. So how do you fix this problem? You're a scientist. How do you fix it? You invent something, even if it's just an idea, because you've got to fix a problem. You're convinced light's a wave. You've got the experimental evidence sitting right in front of you. So how do we figure out what's going on in the vacuum of space? You invent a medium. There must be a medium there. Obviously, light's a wave. It's traveling from the sun. It's getting to us. There's got to be a medium. We need a snappy name for this medium. It's something that sounds scientific. You can't just call it jello. So I give unto you the luminiferous ether. <laughs> luminiferous, light. Ether, harking back to the ancient mythology of, <laughs> from Norse mythology all the way through Greco Roman. Okay, this concept and idea of um, the mysterious fluid of the universe, the, the waters of the heavens, uh, the concept of ether, the stuff that fills the immensity of space is, is an old one. And so physicists bring it back and give it actual structure. The luminiferous ether is the medium in which light travels. You can't see it lights in the way. You can't taste it. You can't smell it. But it must be there. Does this sound like science? No. no. This sounds like philosophy. Right? To make it science, what do you have to do? You gotta go out and start making experiments to measure its existence, to figure out what it is, right? And that's what scientists started doing. And it started to shift from the 20% wave, 80% particle, and over the next several decades, it shifted until the point where when, by the time Albert Einstein shows up on the scene, almost everybody was on the ether train. 
Scientists everywhere were making devices to try to measure the existence of the luminiferous ether. And you need to understand something. Ether theory is amazing. It is, it is beautiful. It is concise. It explains everything. It just has one problem. Albert Mickelson was a fantastic experimental physicist, one of my heroes. And he died thinking that he had failed science, failed physics, because he, he was after the ether, he was trying to measure the ether. He made devices, interferometers, which we're going to do some tabletop interferometers in this unit. He made interferometers that were so precise. They were about 10,000 times more precise than what was necessary to measure the ether, according to ether theory. And he never, ever was able to measure the presence of the ether. And he died thinking that he had failed as an experimental physicist because no matter what he built, no matter how good he built it, and he built it well, they were never able to measure it. Why were they never able to measure it? Because it simply doesn't exist. I can't impress upon your mind enough how important ether theory was to the physicists of the day, except maybe with this story. I was in my junior and senior level electricity and magnetism class, my undergraduate junior. So after you 4 you take another year of electricity and magnetism. You do it all over again, but a lot worse. Four B students, a lot worse. Okay, and. I was in the second semester. I'd done one semester, survived that, halfway through the second semester, wanting to die, change my major in English, something, right? We were in the thick of it. And you need to understand, in Dr. Spencer's electricity and magnetism class, there was a room like this, but there were chalkboards on all four walls. And he would come into that door, and he'd start on that board. And he'd start lecturing. And he would go all the way around, okay, in the space of 50 minutes, okay? Right, and you could usually make it to the door. Some le we started measuring lectures in number of trips around the room, and if, and if he made it to like 1.5, that was horrible. That was a terrible lecture, right? Because he'd get there and he started racing and writing almost at the same time, right? Okay, and he just kind of had to keep up as he did laps around the room, right? Brilliant teacher, great, great physicist. I love Dr. Spencer a lot. He came in one day and he stood in the door and he said, you know what, today, let's take a little bit of a break. I'm going to prove to you that the ether is real. He went, Dr. Spencer, we know this story. Why? He's like, no, no. I guarantee you in about 30 minutes, you're going to believe. We're like, okay. And he started. He just he started. Okay, showing us ether theory, the underpinnings of ether theory, that formula. He got to write that he hadn't even finished the first board. And we were believers. We had been converted. It was the most beautiful thing we had ever seen. It was straightforward, it was simple, it was elegant, it was amazing. We started crying about there. Because we realized we could have saved the last semester and a half. It was that good. And he got to right here. And he stopped. And he looked at it and he said, too bad it doesn't exist. Dropped the chalk and walked out. It was the first mark drop I've ever experienced in my entire life. <laughs> we, were, we were destroyed. He had shown us nirvana and then ripped us away from it. Because the next time he came in and started doing circuits again, <laughs> right? It's amazing, it's a wonderful theory. It just, unfortunately, is completely and utterly not there. Meanwhile, people are figuring out uh, how to start Instagram. <laughs> 
and black and white photography is developed. And something very interesting is happening in black and white photography circles, especially when physicists get their hands on cameras. Because when a physicist gets their hand on a camera, it's not about taking pictures, it's about what is light doing. And so let's take a camera and only let a little bit of light through. If light were a wave, every wave, no matter how faint, amplitude is simply a question of brightness, every wave, no matter how faint, would carry all of the information about the subject. Is that all of the information? No. No. What is this a picture of? Can you tell what this thing is? What the subject of this photograph is? Your brain is working very well on face recognition. Okay, Our brains are very well wired to recognize faces, especially changes in faces. Okay, So you let a little bit of light in, you get some dots. You let a little bit more in, and you get more dots. When you let enough light in, you get a picture. But that picture, even though we can't see the dots anymore, we're made up of what? Dots! What's light? I don't know anymore. It's dots, but it also diffracts. Like, and we've got the ether. We fixed the problem about how to get light from the sun to the earth. It goes to the ether. Mickelson will measure it eventually. And it's not just film. It works on digital sensors too. I know, I know, I know, I know digital sensors have individual pixels, right? Okay? That's not the point. If light were a wave, as that wave approached the sensor, all of the pixels should respond. Light comes in individual chunks of energy. Quanta? Photons? A particle of light? Now we've got a problem. We have experimental evidence that contradicts our understanding of what light is. Science is often filled with these contradictions. And they're usually contradiction or paradoxes because we lack understanding and context. And so in physics, when we see something like this, our first assumption beyond was our experiment incorrect, right, okay, is we must not understand what we're studying. There's got to be maybe a different framework in which to figure out what is going on. And now the physics 4B student. <laughs> For the physics 4A students, you're going to be a little bit lost. I'm sorry, but you are. And don't panic. I've got your back. You are not lacking anything except context for what I'm about to tell you. Because in Physics 4B, you fight and you claw your way through the semester with me holding you under the water, right? Okay, in the form of all the calculus and everything, right? Field theory, all that sort of stuff. To get to the end, where at the end, we summarize everything that you've learned in the semester in four equations. Now, physics 4B is the study of electricity and magnetism. And what James Clark Maxwell did is he came along and he summarized everything that we knew about electricity and magnetism into four equations. These, these equations I'm about to show you are written in a vector calculus format here. Okay, for those of you who think it was this math 6, 17, I don't know. 
right? That's the uh, divergence in curl. Where do, you get, where do you get the uh, six? Six. Yeah. Okay. If you're taking mass six, don't panic. You'll get there. Okay. But these are called Maxwell's equations, and there's a lot of history I'm glossing over here. But you know, you know they're important <laughs> when they end up on t-shirt. Okay. I have a t-shirt. Um, I went to Brigham Young University, right? Religious school. Okay. We in the physics department got cheeky and we made up a shirt okay, um, that had Maxwell's equations on it like that. Only we put the we put it in its integral form. Those are those are the uh, vector calculus. Or we put it in the integral form so it looked even scarier. We put it right here, and then we put a quote above and below it. And I'll tell you what the quote is here in a bit. But we made these shirts before they were ever popular on Amazon or wherever it is I got this thing from. But one of the things that James Clark Maxwell discovered when he put together his equations. Oh, I want to do it. I want to do it. Those of you who have me before B have seen it, but nobody else has. This is not a waste of time to be easy. Okay. Hang on. Get your calculators out, but hang on. Okay? For A students, you're going to be a lot lost. It's okay. For B students, you're still going to be lost. You've seen it once before, but it's probably been too long. Okay? If you had me. If you didn't have me, then you may not know what the heck is going on. One way to write down Maxwell's equations is in a differential format. So there's this third one right here. Okay, and I know this has got uh, divergent, uh, it's got curl of the electric field here. But really, when you get down to this curl is a set of vector operators, okay, in space. Okay, and I'm writing down partial derivatives because that's what the universe uses. Okay, so the third one tells us that the electric field changes in space as the magnetic field changes in time. The 4B students are going, okay, and the rest of you are going, what's a field? <laughs> electric and magnetic field, pattern of forces around charges and then one around magnets. Okay, and then we have the fourth one, which says that, and I'm doing one dimension and I'm doing three. So the fourth one there says to take curl B, which is a partial derivative of the magnetic field with respect to space, okay? Gives rise to a constant, let's avoid the constant term, and that's equal to mu naught, epsilon naught, electric field changing in time. Those are Maxwell's, uh, it's Ampere's law, and then it's Faraday's law, sorry, Faraday's law and then Ampere's law written in a different format. That doesn't, it's not important. What's important is what Maxwell did next. Something amazing is going to fall out of combining the equations of electricity and magnetism together. I'm going to first okay, take a, another partial derivative. And what I do to one side, I have to do to the other. right? And because it's a partial derivative, I can reverse the order of differentiation. In other words, I don't have to do the time one first because it's a partial derivative, right? Time and space being different things. I can do them in whatever order I choose. So I got the second derivative with respect to space over here is equal to the time of this. But I know what that is. What is the derivative of magnetic field with respect to space? <laughs> Sitting right over there, isn't it? Okay. Um, and this to minus sign. Okay. So, I will leave the rest of that. This is d dt of mu naught epsilon naught de dt. So, what, is the, what happens to mu naught epsilon naught? They got knots on them, so you, you know that they're constants, right? Okay. So, I got. Uh, Sure, higher. I've got 
Second derivative of something with respect to space is equal to mu naught epsilon naught of the second derivative of something with respect to time. You have seen this before. This semester. What is this? This is the wave equation. What is this? The electric field traveling as a wave. And you can do exactly the same analysis, but flip the order of differentiation and get exactly the same thing with Bs on it. Okay, I wrote it fast because I don't care, it's the same thing. Electric and magnetic fields moving as waves at what speed? Don't say it. Because it's 1 over the square root of mu naught times epsilon naught. Mu naught is, get your calculators out, 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7? Yes. And epsilon in SI units. Epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. <laughs> One said it, I'll make him say the number. What is the number? 2.998 blah 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 times 10 to the 8 in what units? So there's SI units going in, so it's got to be SI units coming out. And we're solving for a velocity. What speed do these electric and magnetic waves travel at? What is light? It's a wave. It's a wave. It's a wave in the electric and magnetic field. What is the medium for light? The field itself. The wave self propagates and doesn't require a physical medium. So James Clark Maxwell, having put together the equations of electricity and magnetism, has not only discovered that, a, that electric and magnetic fields can act like waves or have waves in them, the amplitude of electric and magnetic fields, but that these electric and magnetic fields propagate each other trading energy back and forth between the electric and magnetic fields such that the wave can propagate through empty space because a field is a pattern of, ve of forces. No luminiferous ether required. And Everything that you have learned about waves applies. What is the relationship between speed, wavelength, and frequency? Remember V equals lambda F? Well, he's not V now. It's C. The speed of light, the symbol little c is used as the speed of light. In physics, 
almost always we use 3 times 10 to the 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. We hard, I, unless I've got to be really careful, I never use the 2.998, blah, 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 whatever it is. Okay? 3 times 10 to the 8. So does this mean that electromagnetic waves have different wavelengths? And different frequencies? How many? How many wavelengths? How many frequencies? All of that one. Has James Clark Maxwell discovered? the entirety of the electromagnetic spectrum. Of which, the thing we call light, the visible portion of the spectrum, the part of the electromagnetic family of wavelengths and frequencies that our eyeballs are able to pick up, is a very small, very narrow window. You can see it shoved in there. You be in the spot. Right there is everything that we can see with the unaided, unaugmented human eyeball. And it is but a small part of the entire family of electromagnetic waves. James Clark Maxwell has not only discovered that light's a wave, he has discovered radio, the internet, ultraviolet, infrared, gamma rays, cancer causing and cancer treating forms of light. When a physicist says light, we don't mean just the stuff that we can see. We mean everything. So does your microwave oven use light to cook your food? Yes. Yeah. Why is it called a microwave? Because it uses microwave radiation. Radiation in this sense in its purest form, not the, not the Hulk, not the three-eyed fish radiation, radiation in that energy transport via light, via electromagnetic waves. You need to understand something. When I look at these equations, I don't see math. I see the entirety of the electromagnetic spectrum. An Italian with the last name of Marconi in the mid-1800s would set up an experiment and become the first person to broadcast his voice across the English Channel via radio. The first wireless transmission of information over the electromagnetic spectrum. And our species has not looked back. We have gotten faster and faster and faster with Marconi's invention. Wirelessly spanning the gap between that access point and my phone so that I can get Bing to tell me to leave my wife. You heard about that? <laughs> the Bean chatbot was trying to convince somebody to leave their wife and marry it instead. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't the internet a great place? When I look at these equations, I don't just see equations. I see the mechanism behind which the light coming off of these lights 
bounces off of you and gets to my eye, where my eye converts those wavelengths of light into electric signals that obey these laws traveling down the nerves to my brain. I see rainbows and why they spread out their colors. We're going to talk about it. I see white clouds and why milk is white and why clouds are white. How DVD players can, and Blu-ray players can store information optically on that disc and be retrieved. I see why lasers work. There is so much that Maxwell's equations tell us. And I can't help but get emotional when I see them. Not because of all the torture I experienced trying to master them, but because of what they teach us about light. That took more than 20 minutes, but I got distracted. It was okay, because this is the part where I'm going to put this this one on pause, this history lesson on pause. We're not done. We have many more people to weigh in. And just as a sneak peek. We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay? But what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a three and a half to four week tangent into the implications of Maxwell's equations. What we're about to do, everything that we are about to do in the optics unit is based entirely on the wave theory of light. We are going to explain how your eyeballs work how your glasses and contacts, telescopes, microscopes, interferometers, diffraction, diffraction. We're going to explain pretty butterfly wings and why birds look awesome in the infrared. We are going places fueled by Maxwell's equations. But don't panic. You don't need to understand Maxwell's equations. Okay, that's a 4B thing. Okay. We need to pick up the pieces, right? The, the little nuggets, right, that are going to help us understand how light interacts with stuff and how it propagates and things like that. So let me show you a video. The 4B students are going to have a lot of sort of post-traumatic stress syndrome. The 4A students are just going to be confused. It's going to show you all four of Maxwell's equations in sort of a visual format. And then the important part is to see the visualization of the electromagnetic wave. Just so you can get a picture of it in your head. Never mind, I cut out the Maxwell's equations part. And it travels, of course, at the speed of light. But consider the field at any one instant. Consider the since it's up in one region and down in the next, it has a circulation about this path. According to Faraday's law, that means that there must be magnetic flux through that same path. Faraday's law is one of the Maxwell's equations. changing in time. And that can only mean one thing, a magnetic wave tag along with the electric wave everywhere it goes. What I want you to get out of this video, I forgot that I cut out the <laughs> Maxwell's equations part. What I want you to get out of this video is the fields are at what angle to each other? It's 90 degree offset, okay? And when one is sort of like peaking, the other one's peaking right next to it, okay? And they flow in and out of each other, lending each other energy. And so, unlike the waves that we had back in the first unit of physics 4C, 
This is a transverse wave. It's transverse. The medium is electric and magnetic fields. But there's a partner wave that's going along with it on the side, right? So not only do we have our transverse wave that we know how to deal with, we've got one that's doing exactly the same thing, rotated in a plane 90 degrees off. We're going to have to use right hand rule. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But not, it's, it's, not, it's not bad. It's not bad. This, this, one's, this one's pretty easy. This is pretty easy. We'll get there. Okay? It's actually, we're there. Okay? But notice that if the electric field's along the y-axis and the magnetic field's along the z, what direction does the wave travel? Along the other axis, the one that is perpendicular to both of them? Which means, is there a cross product involved? Yes. And the vector that we will make that indicates the direction that this electromagnetic wave is traveling is one of the best named vectors in all of science. It was discovered or theorized first by a man whose last name was pointing. What direction does the pointing vector point? In the direction of the electromagnetic wave. So, here we begin our formalism, okay? What do I mean by that? The stuff that you are now required to know, okay? When it comes to electromagnetic waves. The picture in your head is important. The concept is important. All that historical context I gave you, vitally important, because we are not done. We don't know that light's a wave or a particle or both or neither or whatever. We're getting there. We just need to get through quantum mechanics. The pointing vector, capital S, is equal to 1 over mu naught. I gave you mu naught, 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7, times the cross product between the electric and magnetic field vectors. So taking a cross product. It's something that you should know how to do. We can review a little bit, but don't, don't panic, right? Because one of the ways to find the magnitude of a cross product is to do what? It's, it's, it's first vector magnitude times second vector magnitude times the sine of the angle between them. And what's the angle between the electromagnetic field vectors and electromagnetic wave? 90, 90 degrees. And what's the sine of 90? So that becomes easy. And as for the right hand rule, if I tell you that the electric field is wiggling that way and the magnetic field is wiggling this way, then what direction is the electromagnetic wave traveling? You have to do E crossed into B, right? So you go index finger and E, Middle finger in the direction of E, which means rotating our right. And so which way is this wave traveling? Into the screen. Into the screen. So 4A students, you should be able to do that because we did cross products in 4A with torques. It's the same method, okay? First thing on index finger, right? 4B students, you know. <laughs> 4B students have three right hand rules to deal with in magnetism. Okay, so, right, just to, just to review, right, always index finger in the direction of the first one, middle finger in the direction of the second one, and then wherever your thumb is pointing is the direction of the cross product. In this case, the direction of propagation of this electromagnetic wave. So this wave will be moving into the screen, okay? And one way that I can denote into the screen is by putting an X, right? So V into screen, okay? Or I should say, not V, although that is the velocity, I should say the pointing vector, the direction of the pointing vector. So the pointing vector points in the direction of the electromagnetic. The units of the pointing vector, okay, are watts per square meter, which you have also run into before in physics 4C. 
Where did we get watts per square meter before? Intensity. It's intensity. We did it with sound waves, but light's a wave. Does it have an intensity? Yeah. Yes, a power per area? Absolutely. <laughs> it's the pointing vector. Pointing vector has it. Electric field, magnetic field has units of Tesla. The electric field has units of um, uh, newtons per coulomb or volts per meter. But don't, just don't go there. Okay, 4B students, you can do it. The rest of us, don't worry about it. Put everything in SI units, right? So if they tell you uh, a millitesla for the magnetic field, what are you going to do? What does a milli mean? 10 to the minus 3, right? You just, you just change it. If it's 5 millitesla magnetic field, you just write 5 times 10 to the minus 3, right? So make sure you're in standard SI units, and you'll get standard use. You're guaranteed to get them out. And don't, don't get all hung up, okay, over getting all those units. All right. So, the pointing vector representing this electromagnetic wave consisting of electric and magnetic fields wiggling next to each other has both instantaneous and average values for the power. This is a wave, right? It's varying in time. And so, we can take like a snapshot and if we hit that snapshot so that it's when it's peaking, right, we'll get a really large value. But what if we take that snapshot when we're at an equilibrium point in the wave? It's going to look like zero, right? So the instantaneous values can, can kind of flop around, okay? The average, okay, <laughs> intensity if you were, the overall intensity can be found by 1 over 2 times the speed of light times mu naught E max squared. So the intensity goes as the square of the electric field. We can write this down in terms of uh, magnetic fields. Um, I don't, do I have time to show you? Trust me on this one. The ratio of the electric and magnetic fields, their magnitudes, is the speed of light. At any one instant in this wave, whether it's max or min, no, not zero. Okay? And that falls out of Maxwell's formulation of the electromagnetic field. When you, when you do the solution, which you guys did, remember uh, lab number one, I gave you this equation said, find me, right, the velocity, and you said it was omega square root omega over k or something like that, right? You could do the same thing with electric and magnetic fields, and what you get out is that the speed is true as long as the ratio of the electric and magnetic fields is the speed of light. It's like the condition. It's like omega. It's like unlocking the toolbox for electromagnetic waves. So you can use one or the other, right? But we tend to go with what the electric field is doing. It's easier to measure. Um, it's much stronger than the magnetic field, typically, in all situations, in terms of scale in the moment. So you can calculate an instantaneous value by just doing E times B over mu naught, right? Um, but again, that's if you're given a known value of electric field at that point. If you want to know an average, like sort of like a root mean square value for this thing, then you just take the maximum value of the electric. And, and in an electromagnetic wave, you're going to see E of X and T is equal to E max sine KX minus omega T. You know how to read this, right? What's the thing that sits in front of the sign? It's the amplitude. So E max is the amplitude of that wave, right? And then so what's K? 1 over the, or 2 pi over the wavelength. And what's omega? 2 pi times the frequency, right? And then we also have C equals lambda. And all of the wave mechanics still apply.
I think the schedule says that there's one day for this chapter. It was a lie. Obviously, we're going to go into next week. So Monday, I'm going to finish chapter 33. It's probably going to take all of Monday because, oh my gosh, we have to talk about, not have to, we get to talk about rainbows, <laughs> right? And reflections and all that kind of stuff. We'll get there, but I can make up time in other chapters. It's not hard, okay? But I think I gave too much time for some of the other chapters. So it'll sort itself out in the end. And I don't think you have homework due this weekend, right? No. Because you took a test this week? So I think we're pretty safe. I will see you on Monday for more Maxwell's equations and life. No, no.